Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. It, I got to tell you, it's, it feels great to have a campaign again after about four years, and feels great to see all of you. I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the candidates, one of which just disappeared. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the candidates for uh, for joining us this evening, and uh, I think it's wonderful that they've stepped forward and volunteered to, to lead our, our, our great city. So uh, let's have a round of applause for all the candidates joining us. <laughs> this is a volunteer effort on a whole variety of levels, and uh, I, I'd like for the uh, members of the CHOA board have worked so hard to bring together this event to either stand up or raise their hands so we, we can celebrate them. And uh, I want to thank our hosts from Rancho Palos Verdes, uh, our Ronnie and our, our city manager supposedly is on Zoom with us tonight. And uh, uh, where did Terry go? Uh, Terry, Terry always manages to disappear just at the right moment. Uh, Terry uh, Takaoka, who has been our liaison for, for this event, round of applause for Terry and, and the staff. So, um, our big partner tonight is the Chamber of Commerce, and I've got to tell you, I've had the, uh, the, the pleasure of working with them, uh, and uh, Eileen Hupp brings so, so much energy, so much expertise uh, uh, to this event, the planning of this event. So I'm gonna get out of the way and let Eileen take over. Round of applause for Eileen, please. Thank you, Dave, for those kind remarks. So good evening, everyone. Welcome, my name is Eileen Hupp. I'm president and CEO of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Chamber of Commerce. And we are honored to partner once again with the Council of Homeowners Associations, CHOA, to co-host tonight's forum. The chamber is hosting a series of candidates forums as a service to the community. In our mission as a catalyst for business growth, a convener of leaders and influencers, and champion for a strong community, the chamber believes in the importance of providing opportunities for our businesses and our residents to learn about the candidates in our local elections. Over the course of a month, the chamber has actually co-hosted seven, or we've got, I think, three more coming up, seven different candidates forums. We've put all of those, a list of all those upcoming dates on your chair, and they're also posted on the chamber website, and we encourage you to attend and participate in as many of them as you can. In addition, the Chamber would also like to take this opportunity to invite you to join us at our annual Legislative Forum and Luncheon, which is this coming Monday, October 3rd, at Miyako Hybrid Hotel, a longtime Chamber member on Western Avenue in Torrance. We are so honored to once again have as our speakers for that event, our Congressman Ted Liu, our Senator Ben Allen, our Assembly Member Al Moritsuchi, and our Los Angeles County Supervisor Janice Hahn. Tickets for that luncheon event are available for purchase on the Chamber's website, or you can call our office tomorrow. A flyer for the event is on your chair. The cutoff for reservations is six o'clock tomorrow night, and I think we have, when I left the office earlier, about 19 seats left before we are sold out. So please, we encourage you to attend that. It's a great opportunity to interact with these four elected officials. The Chamber, as you may know, is an independent nonprofit organization, and all businesses, regardless of your location, are invited to join our membership. I want to reiterate what Dave said, and we want to thank the City of Rancho Palos Verdes and their staff for providing Hess Park facility, um, for helping with the setup, and to RPVTV for taping the forum. And I want to thank the outstanding team of volunteers from both CHOA and the Chamber of Commerce who are here this evening running tech, collecting your questions, and timing the candidates. This is another example from the Chamber's perspective of how our local businesses give back to the community, and we want to thank all of you, our residents, for for supporting our local businesses. And of course, we want to thank you, the audience, for coming out this evening and the candidates for stepping forward to run. It takes a lot of courage and commitment to run for local office, and the Chamber of Commerce applauds your interest in serving our community. So let's go through a few of the rules of engagement for this evening's session before I turn it over to our esteemed moderator. This forum is designed for you to hear directly from the candidates for the Rancho Palos Verdes City Council. 
We have four of our candidates who are here in person and two who are appearing remotely. They are out of town for business and personal reasons. All candidates, whether they're here in person or on the Zoom, are subject to the same rules. There are three open seats on the council in this election. The time limits that will be adhered to at tonight's forum are as follows. Candidates all will have two minutes for both their opening statements and their closing statements, and then one minute to answer each question. A 15 second warning will be given when you're down to 15 seconds, and candidates, as you know, because you're learning this, when you're down to 15 seconds, you wanna button up that thought because at 15, when it gets down to zero, our moderator is going to politely ask you to stop, okay? We did a random drawing um, prior to this evening, and so that determined the order of speaking. And so we have Paul first, David is remote, you're gonna be number two. Um, following that will be Michelle, number four will be Steve, number five will be Kevin, and number six will be Barbara. But again, you're gonna see, we're gonna rotate the order of speaking throughout the evening. Um, the re rebuttals to the candidates' answers are not permitted. They answer the questions. If you don't like something that someone said, you can address that in your closing remarks. Um, as an FYI for everyone in the audience, this forum is being streamed live via Zoom for viewing only. Um, and it is also being taped by RPV TV for future broadcasts. They'll be broadcasting it intermittently between now and November 8th. And it can also be viewed in a couple of days. It'll be up on the RPV TV's YouTube channel. And it will also be on the Chamber of Commerce's website. If you go to our homepage, halfway down the middle, click under news and you can see the candidates forum we did last week is there. And then the one we did for PVPUSD is there as well. And then it will also be sent to you, the candidates, so you can post it. Um, last but not least, uh, we wanna make sure that we wanna also let you know that you are welcome as the audience members to record this if you would like, um, because everybody else is recording it. But if you are gonna record it, please stand in the back and don't hold your phone up and, and be disruptive to those around you. And of course, everyone, please silence your cell phones. Um, to allow the candidates as much time to speak as possible, we're gonna go straight through to 8.30, no breaks. But please, if you need to get up, and this includes you, the candidates as well, you'll have time while the others are answering their questions questions, just get up, use the restroom, make your phone calls, whatever you need to do, and, and come back, because um, we want to just keep going right through. Um, and again, to reiterate, and we, we, I feel silly saying this because you guys are amazing, but we're going to say it anyway, this forum will absolutely be run in a polite, professional, and respectful manner. These candidates are our neighbors who are stepping up as a candidate. They have signaled their willingness to serve our community, and we want to be respectful of that. We appreciate the audience's anticipated cooperation and your adherence to maintaining a polite and respectful forum for all the candidates. Serving on the city council is an honor and a privilege. It is also very challenging, very time consuming and a heavy responsibility as the council's decisions directly impact the city, our residents, and in some cases, the peninsula as a whole. So before I introduce our moderator, and he will start with the opening statements. Um, please join me in a round of applause for these phenomenal candidates. All right, so now on to our moderator. We are very happy to have one of your neighbors um, right here from Rancho Palos Verdes. Many of you know him, Mr. Noel Park, as our moderator. Noel has a BS in civil engineering and an MBA from USC. He is a registered civil engineer with the state of California. In his professional career, he worked as an engineer and manager in public works construction for 25 years and also was a small business owner of an automotive rel related business for 25 years. He is now retired and so we appreciate that you are taking time out of retirement to come here and do this for us. Um, in addition, he's very, very active in the community, as many of you know. He served as board member and president of the San Pedro Palisades Homeowners Association for 20 years, board member and president of the San Pedro and Peninsula Homeowners Coalition for 15 years, and board member and president of the Pacific View Homeowners Association here in Rancho Palos Verdes for 15 years. And he is a longtime volunteer, supporter, and contributor with, of course, the Palos Verdes Land Conservancy. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Noel um, for um, the opening statements. And please turn your questions into our wonderful volunteers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just very briefly, uh, I was at the last candidate forum, and Jerry DeHovic was the moderator. Jerry's a hard act to follow, and uh, 
he uh, politely but aggressively enforced the rules as have been explained. And uh, I'm gonna do my best to follow his example. Um, I would say that the candidates in turn were very professional and courteous in doing their best to observe the rules so it didn't really become a big issue. But I'll just apologize in advance if anybody uh, is irritated by my telling them their time is up. And as to the, the two candidates on, uh, on Zoom, you can't see the paddles that say 15 seconds and stop. So I'm gonna have to help you with that. So when, when our timekeeper holds up the 15 second paddle, I'm gonna try to politely but audibly say 15 seconds. So hopefully you'll hear me. So that's- we got unlimited time, Noel. Yeah, <laughs> that, that, that's about it for me. I'm gonna get, go right into it here with the opening statements and uh, the first person, it goes by the, peop, the, the way they're seated at the table. So Paul will go first, proceed. This is unlimited time according to Dave or is it two minutes? Two minutes. Okay. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Paul Sayo. I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight because uh, you guys could have been somewhere else uh, better, but you guys decided to join us, so thank you so much. And thank you to the candidates for coming tonight as well. Uh, I've been living here for a long time. I was born in the area. Uh, I went to Marine Land when it was uh, before Terranea. My family walked the trails, my son and daughter enjoy the parks, and we're gonna be here for a long time. I love this community, I love this country, so I served, uh, I went to West Point, uh, I was in the Army for a while, and as part of my duties in the Army, uh, I actually managed assets that were three times the city's revenue, this city's revenue. I also managed a 3,200 uh, man battalion. I did strategic operations, future operations, and made sure that we worked with civilians to make sure we uh, solved the problems of the battalion. My last duty station, I was part of the UN Security Battalion uh, inside the DMZ between North and South Korea. And as part of that organization, we worked with multinational organizations as well as other countries to make sure we solved our missions or we uh, completed our missions. And I had to make hard decisions based on the combat patrols and things that we did in the area. So uh, in regards to uh, the Army, I left and I became a district attorney in LA and now I'm a deputy attorney general. But as part of my job, I also sat on a police advisory board and that police advisory board was for LAPD. We were able to solve crimes like catalytic converter theft, burglaries to homes and things like that. We, we came up with solutions, we applied those solutions and we had results and we lowered crime. So with that, uh, with those experiences, I wanna bring that to the table, I wanna bring it to the city so that we can use that to solve the problems that we have here. So I look forward to everybody's questions tonight and I'm hoping to meet you afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, David. Thank you, Noel. And uh, thank you to my fellow candidates. Um, like Eileen said, you know, this takes a lot of guts to come out and do this. So I applaud each of you for coming out. Thank you guys very much. Um, I'm Dave Bradley. I was uh, born in Los Angeles. Um, I have been a longtime resident of Rancho Palos Verdes. My family moved here a year before the incorporation of the city. Uh, so not only have I gone to grade school here, I graduated from Rolling Hills High School, uh, now Peninsula High, with a long connection to uh, Rancho Palos Verdes and to the peninsula, not just to the greater Los Angeles area. Um, I'm an aerospace engineering um, um, executive. I have led many programs in complex engineering programs over the years, working for uh, several of our major defense contractors. Uh, I now work for General Dynamics here in Los Angeles. I'm a former Eagle Scout from Rancho Palos Verdes, as well as a Little League coach, AYSO soccer coach, AYSO Little League, or uh, um, uh, AYSO uh, uh, referee, uh, which uh, has set me up nicely to uh, to help uh, with uh, the city council uh, within the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, I've had many uh, uh, positions within the city. Um, I initially started out on the Finance Advisory Committee, uh, helping the city with its uh, budgeting process. I then went on to the uh, Planning Commission where I became a chairman of the Planning Commission prior to uh, uh, running for city council where I uh, was successful in 2019. I'm now looking to run again for a second term. Um, I'm very excited to continue the legacy that we have started in this current term. Um, there's a couple things that I think the city needs to continue to hammer home. 15 uh, local seconds, control. Dave. 
being uh, an existential threat to our city, um, as well as coming up with a long-term solution to the Portuguese Bend landslide, both things that I'm committed to do and continue into the second term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michelle. Hi, everybody. Also, thank you for giving us your evening um, with, with, with this forum. Um, <clears throat> some of this you've heard already before. So um, my name is Michelle Carboni. I am a first-generation Italian-American. Uh, my family's from the mountains of Naples. We're uh, cheesemakers. I also found out that Teresa is also Nablatan, which I didn't know. I'm speaking a little Italian back there. Uh, my uh, family uh, immigrated into Canton, Ohio. Um, um, where they actually did a started a cheese making business there. I, I was raised, born, born and raised on some uh, core values: uh, work hard, education, take care of your family, take care of your neighbors, and a lot of faith. Um, I uh, moved to California in uh, '85. My sister was a resident in Palos Verdes Estates. I went to uh, graduate school, worked really hard, went up the career ladder. Um, I'm in healthcare management. Um, uh, one of the things I have a passion when I actually um, take on a, a project, uh, take on a project. Uh, I, my first home was in Redondo Beach, met my husband. Um, we got married. Uh, he was my scuba dive instructor. Actually, my first date, I picked him up on my Harley, so a little bit of a risk taker for me. Um, when um, we lived in Redondo Beach, we were looking for a new home. We worked really, really hard to actually find uh, find a place uh, for our, uh, a home in Rancho Palos Verdes. We've been here 10 years. We actually live in Abalone Cove. Uh, in the past five years, things have changed um, uh, in the neighborhood. We've had crime. Uh, we've had an influx of visitors. I started going to the council meetings. Um, I started going to the preserve meetings. And what I, what I found as I went to the meetings was that um, there was a, a lack of hearing the neighbors and also this oversight management component to it. What I bring to this position is uh, 30 years of management experience with a solution systems-based approach. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for everyone for coming out tonight. Thank you for Choa and the uh, Chamber. I've lived in Rancho Palos Verdes for 38 years, not locally, not just on a peninsula, but the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. This is my city. I've raised three of my children here. They all attended PV schools, K to 12. I've volunteered for services to the city for the past 35 years. Also, I'm very proud of the fact that I've been a referee for 30 years, two as chief ref. Our city's beauty is maintained by its 1989 view ordinance. I was one of the authors of that ordinance. I served on the residential standards committee that resulted in more flexible zoning standards for residents with smaller properties. I served on the Rancho Palos Verdes Planning Commission for 11 years. Two as its, as its chair just rolled off in last, last July. One can't get closer to addressing our quality of life related land use issues than being a member of our Planning Commission. For the past two and a half years, I've also been a member of statewide organization, California Cities for Local Control. It's a nonpartisan organization whose mission is to educate California's elected officials to support the fight against Sacramento's efforts to take away our local control of our zoning and housing development, and to stop treating every one of our two 525 cities within the state the same. We are all not the same. We must continue to fight to maintain our local control over these important issues and decisions. I look forward to the opportunity of the next hour and a half to explain to you my positions on the issues facing the city and to earn your vote. Thank you. Kevin. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Kevin, your man, and I seek your support to elect me, your man, to RPV City Council. I am currently a member of the Financial Advisory Committee, and approximately 20 years ago, I was chairman of the Open Space Park and Recreation Task Force for, the Rancho, for Rancho Palos Verdes. At that time, I was managing a very successful law practice in raising and coaching three boys in soccer, basketball, and baseball. I considered running for council then, but I determined that I didn't have the time needed to devote to council to do the best I can do for our city. When I do something like being a member on city council, I give it my full time and devotion. After retiring from my law practice 15 years ago, my wife and I believed we had the financial strength 
to live comfortably and decided to give back to the community by becoming a high school teacher. I did this for 10 years. I put my life into teaching to help underprivileged students realize that they can achieve the great American dream. I pushed them and I gave them the confidence they would need to succeed. I developed many programs and volunteered to lead many groups to help them. I perceived a huge need and started a group called the Talented Tenth, which provided assistance to students and applying for college. I had no experience in doing this. So I gathered facts, I read, I researched, I sought advice from many people. Yeah. I, called the, I called the heads of admissions at Harvard, Princeton, and Yale and asked what it would take to get my kids into the school. Eventually I, was yeah. asked to, eventually, I was asked to be a college advisor, and through my efforts and hard work of the students, they were accepted into, most, into the most prestigious universities and colleges in the country. This is the type of commitment and devotion I will bring if elected to council. 15 I seconds. Come up, I come up with creative solutions to solve problems and devote my time and effort to their success. I thank you very much and I appreciate your support. Elect me, your man, to RPV City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Barbara? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Barbara Ferraro, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Rancho Palos Verdes. I first moved here 46 years ago, and I believe it takes experienced leadership for this job. I served on the Planning Commission for several years, and from 1995 to 2003, I served on the City Council, both as Mayor Pro Tem and Mayor. I also participated in the initial purchase of open space for the city when we acquired the Forestall property. I was the swing vote when we established the NCCP and the HCP. That's the Natural Communities Conservation Plan and the Habitat Commun uh, Conservation Plan. I believed that it was important to preserve open space for our community. And now we have approximately 1,500 acres in conservation. Some of this land has trails for use by the public, and some parts are for the conservation of endangered species like the Palos Verdes blue butterfly, the cactus wren, and the gnat catcher. Along with state, federal, and, the, and city, and the Land Conservancy, the city was able to recently purchase another 96-acre parcel, which is going to connect a wildlife corridor to some of the existing parcels. It, I think it is important to, uh, for the quality of life in RPV to preserve our views, our vistas, and our open space. I ask you to vote for me so I may continue my service to the community. My website is votebarbaraferraro2022.com. You can check out my information there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll go right into the questions here, uh, starting with Dave. Um, how would you prioritize the city's different infrastructure and capital needs, i.e. Portuguese Bend landslide, civic center, et cetera? Uh, thanks, Noel. Yeah, um, prioritize for the capital improvements or capital maintain, uh, maintenance. Uh, Portuguese Bend is absolutely at the top. It's one of the um, major threats to our city uh, to uh, both identify where the water is coming from, prevent the water from uh, continuing to get into the slip plain, remove the water, and then come up with a long-term solution for uh, maintaining the Portuguese band landslide area. Um, we are on a precipice where if Palos Verdes Drive South were to collapse and take the force main sewer line with it, uh, we could have an ecological disaster. So that is absolutely the number one priority uh, for uh, capital improvements within the city. 15 seconds. After that would come uh, road maintain maintenance and park maintenance, and then we need to look at what we need to do for the updated civic center. 
Um, absolutely. Number one priority is the Portuguese ban. If uh, anyone has actually reviewed the IMAC land flow, the, the report from 2020, and uh, the problem with that particular area um, would um, identify that our, our efforts need to be with the Portuguese ban and that, that landslide. The, my understanding from actually going through that document and um, having discussions with those on the committee that uh, we don't have a lot of uh, options as far as uh, any resources to actually pay um, for the Portuguese ban and the priority as far as um, uh, identifying um, short term as far as the, proto the, the actual um, the prototype as far as if it will work or not. But I think every homeowner in Rancho PV needs to read that that document, and we need to prioritize as a city as far as what we're gonna do with Portuguese Bend. Second to that is obviously the infrastructure with the roads. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve, you're next. Thank you. Uh, Portuguese Bend landslide is our, our greatest challenge and greatest uh, long-term uh, project that we have to address. The city spent a lot of money in the past trying to mitigate the slide and has failed. My approach is to approach this as a phased approach. And before we sink a huge amount of money in that we step by step, invest in this, prioritize it, and then wait to see what we've succeeded in doing, how successful we were, and then pr go proceed on to the next step. This will be a uh, couple things. It'll be more prudent financially, and it will also give us the ability to see how well we've performed in our, in our first uh, phasing of this project. And uh, that, that'll be a different approach than we have done in the past. And I think that's uh, where we uh, we're, are obligated ourselves to be cautious going forward, but we do need to act. Thank you. Okay, uh, Kevin. The landslide is our overwhelming priority um, for anything that we're gonna be doing in the city of a capital nature. I think it's imperative that we work with the Land Conservancy, Rolling Hills, and the state and the city in acquiring funds that we need to come to a long-term solution for this project rather than the fix it as we go that we've been doing for the past 30 to 40 years. I've, I've read the staff report. I find many problems with it. Their, uh, their suggestion to use hardening agents to fill the cracks, I think will cause more damage than it will to cure the problem. Using large boring holes to determine uh, the land movement, I think could lead to serious injuries and potential lawsuits that would hurt the city. Um, and I think we should use satellite imaging rather than LIDAR imaging, which is what is being proposed. Satellite imaging would give us images of the land movement about every 12 days. And we need to gather this information so we can see Stop, where the please, land Kevin. and how Thank fast. You. So we can take the appropriate steps to fix the landslide. Um, uh, we're done. Your, your time is up, sir. Sorry, thank your you. I, I thought you were giving me the 15 seconds. Yeah, I'm sorry. My fault. Okay, uh, Barbara. Okay, well, obviously the most important thing in terms of infrastructure is trying to uh, do something with a landslide. We are constantly currently working on an EIR that will that proposes to do some slant drilling because before we drilled dewatering wells straight down and that did not work because the land moved and it sheared them off. So we're looking at uh, auger drilling from the side and hopefully that will work. I do agree with Kevin. I don't think we should have hardening agents in there. Um, that's number one, obviously keeping our ro roads um, safe and repaired and also medians and islands, we're working on those. So those are all part of the infrastructure that we're working on. Okay, so uh, I would prioritize two things. First one is Portuguese Bend and the second one was cell reception. I'll tell you about cell reception in, in a bit, but the big part about Portuguese Bend is it being urgent. It's a public safety risk. If that whole area were to go into the ocean sewage and ingress and egress for that area would disappear. The next part is making sure we get the federal grants and we need to have the relationships with the state and federal government to give us that money to fix it. Now I mentioned this before, but there's an infrastructure law that just passed that gives resiliency grants to the state 
and we can apply to the state to get that money so we don't have to spend our own money to solve the problem. And the next part is listening to individuals from our community who have expertise, that have geotechnical skills, listening to them to come to a good solution. The next part is cell reception. Uh, the reason I bring this up is because poor Ken Dada broke down on a road. He didn't have cell reception. He was going to a cardiology appointment. I had to pull over to help him out. If he had cell reception, he would have made it and he would have had AAA come and tow his car. He didn't have that. We should have it. It's 2022. We should have cell reception that helps everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, let's try it again. Uh, <laughs> Mich Michelle, <laughs> what will you specifically do to maintain local control of the land use? Uh, specifically do. So um, right currently right now, um, local control, SB9, SB10, um, their um, ACA7 actually kind of died on its way. Um, but I, I think for local control, we as a community have to partner up with other communities and we have to better inform uh, all of all of, the, all of our neighbors, all of our homeowners, so we can get actively involved. I think what happens is we're not well informed enough to realize some of the consequences. If we can, if we could collectively, um, collectively actually work together to make some changes with either some new vote that potentially could happen here, I think we could, we could get the local control back to the city. Thank you. Okay, um, Steve, you're next. Thank you. There actually is a plan for how we're going to restore local control. There's going to be a, a ballot initiative in 2024, and it's uh, look at our neighborhood voices. You can go online and see what they're doing to to to, to take this initiative forward. They didn't quite make it with their uh, with their signatures this last this current year earlier, so they pulled pulled back and they started a two year statewide education program. We need better grassroots of understanding what the problem is, and the city has been pretty good about this, uh, reaching out through actually CHOA, and uh, we're going to educate our population about this. Uh, it's a single digit understanding of what local control is right now, but when people understand that it's the state telling us what to do with land use, and the, then, the, then the, that paradigm of, of uh, understanding shifts to 75% of people are in favor of, of local control. So it's all about education, and that's what we're about to do over the next 18 months. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Kevin. Yeah, I don't, did you skip Dave? No, we're, we'll come to Dave. <laughs> it's you, then Barbara, then Paul, then Dave. <laughs> okay. Um, SB9 is probably the sing single biggest legislative issue that's facing us when it passed. We need to uh, take all efforts to help get an initiative on the ballot for 2024. And then we need to take all efforts to get that, that initiative passed. I think we should have, once we get the initiative proposed, we should have tables at every RPV event. We should contribute money along with other cities and ONV in getting this initiative to the public and making sure everybody understands that local control over our zoning could be very detrimental to places like Rancho Palos Verdes and the other cities on the hill. We have very limited egress and ingress into our cities. 15 and seconds. If people the size of the cities, it would be damaging to our infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara. Okay, well, Sacramento is trying its best to take over local control. And as I mentioned earlier, one size does not fit all. Our city was founded almost 50 years ago because we wanted local control. We didn't want to have the condos on the bluff like um, Redondo and Manhattan Beach. And we're fighting the same fight again, but we are working with other cities. We have... Um, also, we're also working on the initiative, but we are participating right now in a lawsuit regarding uh, SB9. And so we're fighting back. We're doing the best we can to keep, um, to keep local control. And we do hope that more people will pay attention and help us in the fight to get, get our city back. Thank you. Uh, Paul. 
The most important part is, uh, well, first of all, I'm for local control. But the second part is it's law as of right now. And the biggest part that we need to worry about is a collaborative effort between us and Sacramento so that it's not detrimental to our citizens and the people that live in this community. As a deputy attorney general, I know how the state works. I know how those laws work. I'm very familiar with it. And I deal with it on a daily basis. And it, it's important that we follow the law, but within that, make sure that we advocate for our community so it's not detrimental. We mitigate any damages there are, and we educate the public, our, uh, our voters, the people that are in our neighborhoods and our families, to show them exactly what happens when those things are dictated to us. But the biggest part is having a collaborative effort and a friendship that has uh, that will basically reap benefits for us and it helps us in uh, progressing forward so that we don't make bad decisions and we don't want to get penalized by having a bad relationship. Everything stems from having good relationships. So I think I can bring that to the table and hopefully uh, we can get our local control back. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, local control is an existential threat to the city of Rancho Palos Verdes. Um, we have filed a lawsuit uh, in conjunction with the city of Lakewood against the uh, the tenants of SB9 um, as an overreach by the state. We need to continue to do that. Uh, we've uh, recently hired a lobbyist within Sacramento to help push our agenda and make sure that local control is on the minds of our legislators, letters, legislators in Sacramento. Um, we need to continue to work with the various agencies, uh, HCA, uh, in debating our RENA numbers and how that would be enforced within the city. All of these things have to come together, um, as well as meeting with our uh, local representatives, whether that be uh, Assemblyman Marisushi or uh, Senator Allen. 15 seconds. We need to continue to work with our, our uh, uh, Sacramento legislation and continue to push our, um, our way of thinking and help push back for local control because it is an existential threat to our community. Okay, so we're gonna start the next round of question with Steve. Um, what is your opinion of the increasing homelessness and how would you address it? Uh, thank you. I think we have a census that we were told by uh, Assemblymember Marasucci a couple of weeks ago that on Palos Verdes Peninsula, we had a, a census count of six homeless, and four of those were in Rancho Palos Verdes. Now, we're fortunate that we have such a low number. I mean, the geography uh, prevents, and the lack of services prevent us from having a larger, larger problem. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean it's still not a problem. We just have a small part of that problem. You know, th this is a, this is a, a a problem that is really structural in the bigger sense and has to be addressed and broader than just the city of, of uh, Rancho Palos Verdes and Peninsula. But we do have to be compassionate to the people that are in a situation of homelessness, treat them properly, treat them fair and within the, the law. But the bigger question of what we're going to do about it is going to have to be solved by, by a broader community. And we need to be a part of, the, of have a voice in that community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kevin. The, uh, the homeless problem really doesn't affect our city yet to the extent it does the city of Los Angeles, as we've, we've all seen the 10 cities that have grown astronomically over the last 20 years. And my heart bleeds for these people. They need help. Um, I think the people in Rancho Palos Verdes that are homeless, we should have our city officials go to them and find out what their needs are and how we can help them. We should find out if there are shelters we can send them to. Um, I know Torrance is building the uh, the shelters down by the courthouse. I don't know if they're finished yet and if they're starting to be occupied, but perhaps that's some place that we can work out something with Torrance to use their facilities if our homeless people want something like that. But we, we need to treat them with dignity and with respect and to help them whenever we could. 15 Thank seconds. You um, Thank, you. Thank you. Barbara. Okay, well, basically the homeless issue in some ways is being treated as a housing issue when the basic problem is the cause. Why are they on the streets in the first place? And how can we help them with the mental health and with, their, with the addictions? Um, if anyone is homeless here, our sheriffs are prepared to help find a place for them. However, they have to be willing to go and there are shelters available. 
if someone is is um, contacted by by the sheriffs and if they're willing to go and be housed for a time being, there are places available. But I think the broader picture is we need to look at the causes and how we can treat the whole person. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Paul. The first thing is human uh, treating them like human beings. The most important thing is understanding, city council members have to understand the process. So LASA from LA County comes out and does the outreach services. The sheriffs do not contact them because they haven't done anything wrong. So the biggest part is having that relationship with county, which I have, to make sure that services actually do come out, contact the individuals that we have here in the peninsula. I've seen them and they're our neighbors. And we have to make sure that we educate ourselves as leaders to know the process exactly and how it works and send them through the county so that they get proper services and they get proper housing. We can throw up uh, issues all the time and say, you know, hypotheticals, but there are routes that LASA gives uh, to make sure that these services are generated to these individuals and we can contact them. We have to be proactive and then not reactive to the situation. And I think uh, Palace Verde is in a unique position because we don't have 60,000, we have six. So we can lead on this issue and make sure that it doesn't grow into a festering cancer. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think we have to have compassion. I mean, these folks uh, by and large are really down on their luck. So we need to be compassionate about it. But we also need to provide services and LA County um, is in the proper position to provide those services. So we need to work with LA County Homeless Services to make sure that we are able to provide substance abuse help to provide mental health help. And then for the folks that have just fallen over the edge um, of um, financial stability because of a, um, a recent job loss or uh, medical bills or something, help with a helping hand to provide. But as uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Ferraro said, uh, we have to go after the cause, not the, uh, the symptom. So we need to look at the root cause for homelessness, even though we have a small seconds, number Dave. of homeless with within the city. We need to make sure that we service those uh, folks as well and work with LA County to provide services. Um, the homeless issue. When this question came up at the first debate, I, I, one of the things I mentioned, I actually have approached a, a, a homeless person as I do my runs and my jogs daily and try to be helpful. The problem I had from a process perspective is when I try to reach out to our city government and say, what do we do? There's no, there's no answer that I can actually even get from, from our officials here as far as trying to understand what the process is and what we should do so that if we want to approach this based on what services they may need or can be provided, that we collectively as a city are aware of what we can and cannot do and, and try to actually be in front of this with, with whatever services we potentially could, could provide for them. Thank you. My apologies. Um, okay, we'll start the next round with Kevin. Uh, bike lanes on Western Avenue, do you approve or not? I do not because they're going to reduce the size of the lanes and cause more traffic and congestion, which could lead to more accidents uh, and damage to per persons and property. I think there's alternate routes that the city and county can use for bike lanes. We have bike lanes all over our city. I don't see the need to put them on the most congested road in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you. Barbara. Well, I could just say ditto. Um, Western already has so much problems with the traffic, and I certainly don't want to see them reduce the lane width, and that's exactly what Caltrans is talking about is to reduce the width of the lane so that they can squeeze in the bike lanes. So if we can persuade them not to do that, because Caltrans is the one that has jurisdiction, even though half of the street is in RPV and half of the street is in LA City, Caltrans still runs the show. So we're hoping that we can persuade them not to put in the bike lanes. Thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, if it detrimentally affects traffic and it's going to be so bad to the point where we start uh, having casualties and things like that, then no. But I think it's a good opportunity for people to go up and down that corridor. There's no other avenue of approach into Western in that district uh, without a bike path and people that do use it. But if it's, if it's something that's feasible, I'm for it. But if it's detrimental to traffic and it's dangerous to the actual cyclist, no. 
David. Yeah, no, I don't support uh, the current Caltrans plan of reducing the lane width from 12 foot to 11 foot. I think that's going to further congest traffic along Western. Certainly with Ponta Vista coming online, um, it's going to make getting out of uh, San Pedro area along Western almost impassable. Um, I do support bike lanes where bike lanes are warranted and where there's a need. Uh, currently, I don't see that Western Avenue has a great need for a bike lane. I have never seen a tremendous amount of bike riders. Um, there is not a major corridor there that is within biking uh, where people are uh, commuting to work or commuting to um, uh, uh, leisure activities. Uh, so I think this is uh, Caltrans maybe uh, trying to uh, fix a problem oh, that is 15 not seconds. So I think we have to look very hard at that, but I do support bike lanes in general, just not in their current uh, substantiation along Western. Thank you, sir. Um, Michelle. Um, I, I do not support uh, bike lanes there on Western. I know when Caltrans, Caltrans did the presentation at the council meeting, I, I do not think that they did a, a, a valid job of, of identifying the impact on, on traffic or even on the safety of the rider. So uh, again, I think bike rides need to be placed where they're, they're, they're most you know, appropriate and on Western, you know, that would be something I wouldn't support. Thank you, and Steve. Thank you. No, I, I think that's just going to add danger to both the autos that are on that road by, by making their load, their lanes more narrow and put uh, bike riders at risk. So, you know, sometimes bike lanes, they're not at the, the fastest corridor. So it takes some rerouting for that to have bike lanes. I'm also a supporter of having bike lanes, of course, but there's uh, there has to be a safety component and that has to be the priority. So I do not support that. Okay, um, we're gonna start the next round with Barbara. Uh, this one's a little bit long and the printing's kind of small, but I think it's, uh, it's worth asking. The Eastview area of RPB was annexed by the city some years after the city was incorporated. Some residents of our HOA in Eastview slash Rolling Hills Riviera feel like our residents are sometimes ignored by the city. What would the candidates do to ensure that all parts of the city are included in the city's future? Interesting that you should start with me, and I only have a minute, but I, when I was on the council before, I worked so hard to get our students to be able to go to the PV schools. However, it was not possible to strike a deal where the land itself would become part of the school district. So if any of you are in Eastview, you know you can't vote on the school board, but you can on the city. We try. I mean, we were just over there at one of the homeowner socials this past weekend, and they are included as much as we possibly can. And um, they're a very important part of our city. And I'm glad that we were able to get the students into the district and that's made a big difference for them. I don't see them as not being included. They're an in integral part of our city. Okay, thank you, Paul. I've been walking for three and a half months now and I've been knocking doors for three and a half months and I'm doing everything possible that I can to touch voters in this city. Um, I passed out over a thousand flyers myself and I have people walking for me. Uh, because it's important to touch everybody and knock on somebody's door and ask them the concerns that they have. Now, that's my pledge to Eastview, and the, the question that came up is, I want to include you. I, I showed up to the HOA meetings because it's important. Everybody's important. Their views are important, and I'm trying my best to touch everybody I can before this election is over. So I'm spending a lot of time, my lunch breaks, walking. Uh, when I come home, I ask my wife, hey, can I go out? She says yes. You know, so I get the permission to go and walk. So I'm doing the best that I can to, to talk to everybody, to hear their concerns and make sure that, you know, they're heard. And I think the most important part is just listening as a city council member. And that's one thing that I can promise is that I will listen to you no matter what the issue is to figure out what a, a good solution would be. Thanks. Thank you, David. As an East Side resident, uh, I have strong ties to the East View and Rolling Hills Riviera uh, neighborhoods. I'm down there often. I have many friends down there. Uh, I know because of the geography of the city of Rancho Palos Verdes, it, it, it's somewhat 
uh, congruent so that it, it does seem like there are different pockets. But uh, Western Avenue Beautification Project, which the city has in, embarked upon uh, trying to help improve the medians, help improve the uh, uh, the walls and the look of the Western Avenue corridor, working with both LA City and Caltrans to improve that corridor, I think is all integral. Um, I don't believe that we have uh, um, ignored Eastview. They are absolutely part of the city. Uh, we continue to work with that those neighborhoods seconds. And, and provide services. And I and as in the next term, we'll continue to work on the Western Avenue beautification as well as working with the residents there for their needs. Thank you. Michelle. Uh, Eastview, actually there's a section in the original goals that talks about um, them coming into the city, which I found quite interesting. Uh, it's outreach. Uh, perception, if you feel ignored, then it's perception. We, as a council, if I'm, if, you're, if I'm your council representative, I would do an, a very extensive outreach to actually hear the neighbors, hear what their concerns are and what their perception is and how best to try to address their issues. So if they're feeling ignored, as in my neighborhood, I didn't think the council was listening to us and our concerns either, I would make an extensive effort to actually do, uh, do an outreach to, to all areas of RPV. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Thank you. Um, I had the opportunity to be at their Homeowners Association uh, party, Ice Cream Social, uh, last Sunday, just a couple of days ago. And the two top issues there are the traffic because it's generated because of actually, uh, historically because of the school situation, that their kids in their neighborhood are exported to other places and other kids are imported to their local school. So there's a couple of crunch times during the day that that's just not a workable solution. There is some things that he's doing actively right now with trying to manage the turn there and to redirect traffic and some better timing, but that involves Caltrans, so there's a work in progress there. The other thing is a beautification project, and that's with the walls, and we're also actively engaged with doing that at the moment, where we're choosing a color to standardize what that looks like along the corridor. That's also a challenge, because that's not all uh, RPV that gets involved again with uh, back and forth the city of San Pedro. So they're an integral part of the community. And I think that ongoing involvement will uh, hopefully they'll see responses. Thank Kevin. you. Kevin. Thank you. Um, Eastview and all parts of RPV should be made to feel that we're part of one city. If you feel your voices aren't heard, contact me and I'll help you. Let me know when your meetings are and I'll come. Um, I think all of us on council would be committed to that. I don't think anybody in RPV should be feel like they're an outsider. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll start the next round with Paul. Uh, this one, another one's a bit long, bear with me. Uh, I think it's appropriate. Uh, during periods of high fire danger, would you support closing the preserve in the interest of public safety and habitat preservation? Efforts to reduce fuel load and to install wildfire cameras are helpful, but a simple measure like closing the preserve during periods of greatest risk seems like a prudent approach. So of all the sitting council members, I, I think I've actually fought a fire before. In the Army, uh, there was an issue we had inside the DMZ where I actually fought it. Um, and it's a very, very dangerous thing, and it's a fast-moving item. So for me, paramount for me is that our city is safe, our community is safe, our homeowners are safe. So if that needs to happen and we need to shut down the preserve because it's high fire season, I'm all for it. Now we, ha we do have a fire protection system, but that system, in my opinion, I've used a lot of systems before in the army uh, and in civilian life, that system is only as good as people behind it and if it's monitored 24 seven. Now, if there's a link, if it goes directly to the fire station when a fire happens, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a usable piece of equipment. But if it's not monitored and goes through three different layers to get to the fire station, then it's not a good piece of equipment, uh, not uh, a good investment. But long story short, I would shut it down if we had to for the safety of our community. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, I think there's a couple things with wildfire danger within the preserve. First of all, we need to continue to push on Southern California Edison to underground our utilities and make sure that the number one source of ignition um, down utility lines is mitigated as much as possible. We've worked with them over the last several years and they put in fast switching uh, buses, but that is only uh, 
uh, at the edge of the problem. We need to continue to work with Southern California to so underground those utilities. Uh, the installation of the wildfire cameras, I believe, is going to be a huge step forward in monitoring and being able to alert our first responders quickly. Um, if the last resort would be to limit access to the preserve, uh, there is some issues or challenges with doing that uh, due to uh, the number of egress places within the seconds. preserve. But, but we need to continue to work with the community to come up with the safest uh, preserve that we can and make sure it uh, has the least um, likelihood for wildfire finish issues. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, thank you. Uh, closing down the preserves. Um, I would like to think in our emergency preparedness plan that we've got some mitigation uh, efforts in there that we would we would essentially uh, activate in, in 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 such a situation and closing down the preserves that that would be one of the mitigation efforts and I, I think we would actually be closing down. So one of the things to be considered in the emergency preparedness is the closing down of the preserves if warranted based on whatever circumstances are happening at that time. So I would say yes, you know, effectively to close it down. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. Uh, if you were at that extreme situation, I would support closing uh, down the preserve. But what I'd like to see different with the with the uh, undergrounding of the utilities is we've been talking to SC Edison for forever, basically, on this. And I think what we have to do is we have to approach this differently. We need to scope a project. If there's 100 telephone or utility poles up there now and we need to underground them, that's a project. We need to scope it. We need to determine where we'd like to see that underground routing, and then we need to cost it. And once we have that package ready, it's gonna be a whole lot easier to go out and get funding to help us do that. Because right now, it's we wanna do this. If we do this properly and we, pre, we do the front end work for, for the project and have it project ready, that'll help us to obtain money because there is that type of money out there for infrastructure improvements from different sources in state, federal government, and county. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin. I think the city has done an excellent job in moving forward with the artificial intelligent cameras that are we're moving forward with to put in that will detect smoke at the early stages of any fire. And I think that's to be applauded using technology to help us with wildfires and working with the other cities in that effort uh, is admirable. Um, I don't support closing the preserve. Uh, we're in high fire situations for about six months out of the year. So I, I don't know if you're talking about that season or one or two days a year, but to close the preserve for six months, I don't think is uh, something that I would be in favor of at all. Um, perhaps hiring more rangers during the dry seconds. season would be more effective. Um, but I think our preserve is there for the community and for everybody to enjoy. Thank you. Barbara. Okay, well, we've already been working with the Land Conservancy to remove um, high uh, fuel uh, plants. And we just recently approved the installation of these AI cameras that detect smoke um, and give us an early warning if there is a fire. So we're working on those things. If we needed to, yes, we could close the preserves. Um, only if it's really necessary, I think. But some of the area that is in conservation is only for um, the preservation of some of the endangered species. So um, it's a smaller part that's actually open to the public all the time. And we have the cameras working. We're working with uh, Southern California Edison to see about undergrounding and mitigating those circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, start the next round with David. Uh, what would you do if studies show that water coming from septic and landscaping runoff from rolling hills is a large factor controlling the PV landslide? Well, that's a pretty easy uh, question to answer. We need to turn the water off that's getting into the landslide and getting into the benzonite slip plane layer. Um, 
we need to work with Rolling Hills, uh, if that is actually true, uh, to help install sanitary sewers to remove as much of water as possible from the top of the bowl that is the is the Portuguese Bend landslide area. Uh, we need to also work a uh, look at other water sources that have gotten into that bend slide later in the slip plain and figure out how to prevent that water from getting in, get the water out, and then have a long-term solution to seal it off so we continue to stabilize that area. Thank you. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, another one of those priorities. Um, my understanding that that is one of the issues and that we need to work with Rolling Hills in regards to whatever efforts to minimize that water and that sewer that's going into those areas. So another priority, work with Rolling Hills and any other sources of the water and try to try to control it better. Thank you. Steve. Thank you. There's a, of, of course we would work with anybody that would help us solve the problem. If you look at uh, the, the number of houses on the south side of uh, Crest Road in Rolling Hills, we're talking about two dozen tops. So if all those houses have septic systems, the cumulative effect of that is just not gonna be that large. And some of our geology, geological work in the past has made the point that maybe, maybe it contributes 5%, and that's an unknown. We really don't know the sourcing on this. But I wouldn't look too heavily is that that's gonna be the, the way we're gonna solve the problem for water getting, getting into Portuguese Bend. I think if there is any, any part of that, of course, we go, that we could prove, which I think is also it's our, our, our ultimate challenge and where the water's coming from, uh, I would certainly support doing that, but I'm not looking that for as the, uh, this, the, this the, the big answer. Thank you. Kevin. We need to take all steps that are gonna help uh, solve the landslide issue. If that's 5% or 10%, then we need to shut that off any way we can. We need to work with rolling hills. And I said that earlier. Uh, they're an integral part in the solution. And we work, should work with everybody that's part of the solution, including our, our city, uh, the, the, land, the conservancy where most of the land is, and the city and the state to help us with funding to take care of this uh, issue that is the number one issue in our city. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Okay, well, if any of you have ever held bentonite, it's a rock, but all you need is water and it becomes almost like soap. And that's part of what is helping the area slide down the hill. There is some water we know coming from rolling hills. I was just with one of their council members the other night and I mentioned that we might be interested in seeing if they would cooperate, and she was not really excited about the idea. So yes, we are working with other city governments, and sometimes we don't get the response we want. But as part of the EIR that we're working on now, we're trying to determine as much as we can where the water's coming from, and then what can be done about those particular sources to slow the earth down. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. I think the biggest thing uh, that we need to figure out is stop planning in a vacuum. I think everything that we do, we, we don't cooperate or have a relationship with other cities. And I won't bother mentioning it now, but we need to stop doing that. And if there is water that's leaking, and I know that it is, we need to stop it, first of all. But we need to start developing a, a solid plan with the relationships intact so that they're brought to the table and not told, hey, you need to pay for it. We need to figure out a good relationship so that we can go have a plan together to solve the actual issue itself. The other part is the urgency part of it. In my opinion, this we keep bringing up this issue, but nobody's saying that it's a public safety issue. Nobody's saying it's urgent and it has to be addressed right now because literally, if we talk about it today, it could fall in tomorrow. And if we knocked on those doors and those people say no to us, you know, we can point the finger and say, hey, we talked to you yesterday, now it's in the ocean. So we have to make sure that it's urgent and the messenger is there to say it correctly. Thank you. Okay, we we'll start the next round with uh, Michelle. What and where are the top traffic concerns in our city? 
um, this question from the first debate. I actually had to have the, do my little homework here. Um, the traffic, some of the major traffic concerns are, are Western. Um, the, that particular area is a major traffic um, concern for homeowners and also based on some of the feedback that I have gotten. Uh, Hawthorne also now, um, some of the feedback um, towards where the school is, is now uh, a, a traffic area of concern for homeowners. So of those two areas, I think need to be a priority as far as trying to see how we can actually mitigate and make some improvements in those areas. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve. Thank you. It, it's uh, it's Western Avenue. We see that's the greatest traffic volume. Where you've talked earlier about the fact that we have some intersections that just really don't function well at all during uh, certain times of the day when the, when the schools let out, and uh, and uh, it also at it, it, the rush hours you're on Western Avenue and you really are in a bit of a gridlock situation. So that's a that's a, and that's challenging for us because of uh, Caltrans owning the road and the cooperation is necessary between uh, the City of Los Angeles and uh, City of Rancho Palos Verdes with Caltrans in charge. It's not like we haven't tried. It's uh, this is an ongoing discussion with the new houses coming on board, obviously in Green Hills, it's going to intensify as well. And we just have to keep plugging at that. We have to have our voices heard and we are, we have some incremental improvements and in specific intersections, but uh, we have to keep plugging away at that. And uh, there, uh, there's going to have to also address the things like uh, the bike lane was part of that solution of not going forward or something like that. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. The traffic in our city is not that bad when there's no construction going on, when school is not starting or letting out. Um, and I, th I think we're lucky to live where we have. I think the biggest threat to our traffic system is SB9, which could cause an influx of new residents in our city. Um, there perhaps is a need for a couple of more traffic lights around the city. I think they should be smart traffic lights. So when there's nobody sitting there, it doesn't turn. Uh, it just stays green for those who are moving with traffic. Uh, but I think we're fortunate to be in the city that we are with the, the low amount of congestion that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Okay, some of the biggest traffic concerns are on some of the steep streets, even um, even Hawthorne, as you're going down the hill, we have installed a light at Vallon. We installed one at Via Rivera. Um, there are some streets that have humps, not bumps, but humps that slow traffic down. So if a neighborhood wants to get together, they can and ask for some of these traffic calming uh, ideas. But basically, Western Avenue is probably our biggest traffic concern. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Uh, walking for the past three and a half months, I've been able to talk to a lot of neighbors and they did bring up the traffic issues, top three actually. And they named three roads, uh, Western, Peavey Drive South and Hawthorne. Hawthorne because, you know, for obvious reasons, I don't know too long ago that you guys know that Tiger Woods crashed his car. So, you know, they bring that up a lot. But the other portion is high school students going up and down that street. And we know, my family knows a couple of students that have wrecked their cars because of the, how, it's not treacherous per se, but um, I think we can do better. We can put more things in to keep people safe. Now in regards to PV Drive South, uh, there's a lot of folks that drift and do donuts. So those are huge things that can uh, mangle up traffic and also hurt people and kill people. So that's a concern that a lot of our neighbors bring up. And lastly is Western. I think we need to develop a better relationship with Caltrans to figure out how, can, how we can mitigate traffic there. And uh, hopefully they can give us better feedback and options for them to actually participate in making it better as opposed to just complaining to them. Thank you. David. Thank you. Um, I think we, the Traffic Safety Committee needs to continue to be involved in uh, all of these decisions. There are um, subcommittee of the city council or the arm of the city council to go off and try to work some of these issues. Um, I think there are three major issues that we continue to work and are trying to come up with solutions for. First of all, is Hawthorne at, uh, Boulevard at Fallon and the lack of visibility as you come around the curve. 
The second is uh, Palos Verdes Drive East coming down the switchbacks. Uh, we continue to work with the sheriff for enforcement. But, you know, some days it looks almost like Laguna Seca there. So we need to continue to provide um, uh, uh sheriff oversight and enforce the traffic codes also western avenue as some of my fellow candidates have talked about 15 we seconds need to work, they, we need to work on making sure, sure that we get the volume of traffic through there and being able to get the ingress and egress through the western avenue corridor as high as possible um, and reducing it for bike lanes is probably not the right answer so 11 to 12 foot lane or 12 to 11 foot lanes is not going to help okay um well, I guess this is gonna be the last question. We're running out of time here. I've got some really interesting ones, so it's a tough decision. Um, we're starting with Steve. Um, are you in favor or against using debt to finance a number of city infrastructure projects such as the landslide or the civic center? Hey, thank you. Am I in favor of debt? No, I'm not in favor of debt. I think there's more to that question that I'm only going to get a minute to answer this with. You know, we have some capital projects that are in front of us here. We've just gotten through Ladera Linda where there was some debt associated with decision making on the part of the council to do that. So we have to look at big picture stuff. At the end of the, the, the day or the end of a 10 year period, how do we best use our resources? Money that we've saved, money that we can borrow cheaply, money that we may get from grants from different agencies around uh, the state and federal state and federal and county government. And that's that's really what this is about. And also the phasing of how we use that money. So that's a that's a really, really simple question, but a really complex one. So with my last 15 seconds, I'm gonna say I'm against that. But that doesn't mean under certain circumstances we may not be forced in to have a situation where we have to uh, have some debt. But that's, I'm not in favor of that. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara, uh, my, my mistake. Kevin. I am not in favor of incurring any further debt for any capital projects that are not tied to health and safety. With, uh, the landslide is health and safety. I would consider going into debt for that if we need to. Um, as a member of the finance committee, we were able to secure a loan for Ladera Lender at 1.9%. Currently, those rates are between 4 and 5%. So it's getting very costly to take on any debt. Um, I am in favor of uh, starting a committee for fundraising for capital projects that are not health and safety based. And I've been led to understand that City Council is now in favor of such a committee and is looking into starting a committee with fundraising concerns for most of our capital projects, including Civic Center. 15 I seconds. Would be in favor of that, and that's how I would fund a capital projects of that nature. Thank you. Barbara. Okay, well, we are working on finan uh, financing part of the landslide project with grants from, we're hoping, the state and the federal government. In terms of incurring more debt, I hope we don't have to do that. Um, as was mentioned, we did um, take, a, take a loan for 1.9% 1, 1 for part of La Dera Linda, and we're paying it back with dollars that um, are inflated, and so it, th at the time, that was a good thing to do. But it all depends on the circumstances and the uh, the project and the need, and it depends on health and safety as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Thank you. Personally, I don't like debt. I don't like paying other people to borrow money, but if done correctly for certain projects, I'm all for it. Now, the reason why I say that is because there are certain things that we need in this community, uh, and then it's not saying that we'll pay out of our own pockets for the whole thing. It behooves us to go get federal funding. It behooves us to get state funding, and we need to stop thinking about just paying out of our own pocket when there's a bucket of money at the federal government level that will to provide the funds for us to make certain projects, right? Like to fix Portuguese Bend, to do the Civic Center project. If you frame it correctly and have the correct relationships, in which I do, I have an economics background, so I understand. I'm the vice chair of the Civic Center Advisory Committee. 
So we I specifically understand the issues at hand, but we need to stop thinking within our own budget and we need to go outside and get that money and do everything possible, like Kevin said, even private funding from our neighbors to be able to uh, fund projects. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Noel. Yeah, I'm in favor of sound financial planning. Um, I think we have done some really phenomenal things uh, with the finance department within the city. Um, and we have uh, leveraged our assets and our uh, capital position to be in a really strong position right now uh, coming out of COVID. One that is uh, almost unheard of for a city our size. We need to continue that uh, conservative fiscal policy um, limit the amount of uh, borrowing we have, but borrow when we have the assets to pay it off. If we can leverage our current position, I think that that's a legitimate uh, financing uh, position. I also think that we need to continue to work with uh, the federal, state, and local levels for additional grant funds. We have been successful with getting uh, grants um, and earmarks at the federal level for Portuguese Bend. 15 we seconds. We are continuing to talk, talk to... Um, our state assembly, as well as county funding sources to work on some of these really major issues such as Portuguese Bend. Thank you. Okay, Michelle. Um, one of the founding goals for RPV that we were built on was fiscal responsibility. And fiscal responsibility means, you know, managing the monies such that based on priorities that you don't go into debt. And if you've, you do go into debt, it has to be argumentally solid based on some health or safety issues for that. So going into debt, that may be an, an option for us. If there are, is no funding out there and we have to pay for ourselves, I think prioritizing the project based on the needs of our city, I think needs to be a priority and a prioritized based on the health and safety of our city and of our community and of our neighbors. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, we're quickly running out of time here and we're gonna go to the closing remarks, which are gonna go in reverse order from how we started. So we're gonna start with Barbara. Okay. Two minutes. Two minutes. All right, we have many issues facing our city, the most important of which I believe is local control. Our city was founded almost 50 years ago to achieve local control. One size really does not fit all. Our city has its own set of challenges. We are sound financially, but we do have a landslide within our city's boundaries. And we are almost completely built out. Yet the legislators in Sacramento are con uh, constantly trying to dictate how we manage our city and provide services to our community. SB 9 and 10 have been particularly onerous for our city. Rancho Palos Verdes was founded to keep density low, and the state wants us to add 647 new housing units to our neighborhoods. Another important aspect of our city government's governance is fire and safety. We have approved smoke detecting cameras to give us early warning of fires. The city helps homeowners associations with the cost of flock cameras to support the sheriff deputies with crime reduction. I am the delegate to the California Joint Powers Insurance Authority, which evaluates risk management for RPV. I believe I have the experienced leadership that is required of a council member. I humbly ask for your vote as one of your three choices. Please mark Barbara Ferraro for city council on November 8th. I'm the last one on the ballot. They saved the best for last. Vote Barbara Ferraro 2022.com is my website. I appreciate the chamber and Choa having this debate tonight. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Kevin. 
I want to thank you, Choa, and the Chamber of Commerce for sponsoring this debate to enable our citizens to get to know us, the candidates for City Council. I think you have a great group to choose from, and I wish you luck in learning about us and making your choices. Thank you to everyone in the audience for being patient with me for doing this debate by remote, as I am in New York for a memorial service for my brother. Tonight you heard from us, the six candidates. I have been committed to community service for nearly my entire life. I am dedicated to putting my entire effort to help Rancho Palos Verdes find solutions to the many issues that face us. Chief amongst these are the landslide, local control through overturning SB9, and maintaining the financial stability that our city enjoys by not undertaking further debt for the building of a civic center or any other grand project that is not needed for our health and safety. No further debt. I will work diligently to try to resolve issues such as coyotes, homelessness, One crime minute. reduction, and any issues you bring to my attention. I will be here to help you. I've spoken in specific terms as to how I will help you deal with certain situations, and I am sure you can find uh, and judge the candidates for yourselves who will have the time and commitment to devote to being a council member. Please vote for your man for city council. Thank, Thank you, sir. Steve. Thank you. And thank you to Choa and the Chamber for hosting this forum. You've heard the candidates on a range of topics that are important to us, the residents of the city, and about the city's future. We as candidates are all public service-minded people running for office, or we wouldn't be here doing this. I hold two master's degrees, one in uh, land use planning and one in public administration, and began my professional career as a land use planner. I believe that the education, background, experience, and desire to help our city even more as a member of city council. I'm actively supported by nearly every city leader, past and present, including present council members, John Cruikshank, Eric Alegria, Mayor Dave Bradley, as well as uh, LA Supervisor Janice Hahn, and also from uh, uh, council member Ken Dida, who his endorsement is really to replace him on council. So I, I, I think that's a very large footsteps that I'll try to fill on city council. In addition, I'm endorsed by the Association for LA Deputy Sheriffs, ALADS, and California Cities for Local Control that I spoke about earlier. So why vote for me in this election? My response is that I'm experienced matters. I have a real positions on the topics that impact our city. We discuss them, and I hope I made some of my positions clear and, and not just sound bites, but through thought and, and I have made statements on what I want to accomplish, and in some cases, even the process of how to get there. Some positions have evolved over time with greater understanding, applying my background, experience, observation, common sense, and speaking with residents continually. That's never stopped in my 38 years of being, being a part of this community. I won't stop listening, and I welcome the input. And finally, please visit my website, electparistam.com. There are links there to other organizations that are fighting the local control fight, United Neighbors, Our Neighborhood Voices, California Cities with Local Control, so you get a real good picture of the challenge before us in the next coming year until we get that ballot initiative. I respectfully ask for your vote. Thank you. Michelle. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for um, for coming this evening, and thanks to Dave. He, uh, he's instrumental in me actually running um, I'll be really brief. Um, in regards to the bigger issues um, outside of RPV, I actually work at the grassroots level as far as gathering signatures, knocking on doors, uh, getting the communities, all communities, a lot more informed so that they can make better decisions and better uh, voting uh, choices for that. I made the decision to actually run for city council because of I love this city and my concerns by going to the council meetings, re reviewing all the documents, meeting minutes, all the information that's currently right now on the RPV city website. And I, I came to a conclusion that there's not a, a systems approach with data analysis indicators and that really complete analysis in our government management and the oversight clearly is is missing it, it and, and I think part of me getting involved is that I have the education I have the work experience I have 
passion like you would not believe as far as trying to find solutions. And that's why I'm asking you to make a change and vote for somebody with a business perspective for our government and be able to listen to the neighbors, which is why I decided to run, because we weren't being listened to. So vote for Michelle and make a change in your, in your, in your city council. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Eileen and the Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to uh, thank uh, Dave and Choa, as well as you, Noel, for doing this tonight. I know you had better things to do this evening. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank our city staff for helping uh, to set up and tear down. Uh, I know this is not something that happens easily, and there is a lot of people that go behind it, so thank you. I also want to thank my fellow candidates. Um, everyone on uh, this uh, uh, debate tonight or... Um, forum tonight um, is really putting their neck out there. So thank you all for having a love of the city, um, just like I do. Um, I have a strong history with the city. I've lived in the city since its inception. Um, so I do understand the issues of our city and I do deeply care about solving them and maintaining long-term solutions for our, our issues. Um, I have local support for my campaign. I'm not a, a looking for nor accepting any support from outside of the peninsula. Um, I think this needs to be a peninsula or a, actually a Rancho Palos Verdes uh, driven election. I think One that's minute. where we need to be at, at the local level. And I think we need to continue to push uh, for um, strong local control. I'm dedicated to local control and I have a history of solving very complex problems both professionally as well as uh, on the city council. Um, that I will take the, that experience and that passion for our city and for problem solving that I do uh, during my daily work uh, to the city council and continue to leverage that for the, uh, to maintain the semi-rural atmosphere of our uh, city. I also will continue to bring a mutual respect on city council to all of my fellow council members, as well as all the, the current uh, candidates as we move forward. Uh, thank you very much. Vote for David Bradley for RPV City Council on November 8th. And thank you very much for your time in watching this, uh, this debate uh, this evening. Thank you. Paul. Uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone that's sitting here in the audience today because without you guys, without your input and your time, we wouldn't be able to do this and city council members wouldn't have the input to actually properly execute decisions that they make. Now, like I said, I've been walking for three and a half months and I've listened to a lot of people and they don't know a city council exists. That's a shame. A lot of folks think that this entire city or in, entire hill has one city council. When I tell them there's four, they're amazed. The top three things that they talk to me about is cell phone reception, crime, and traffic, right? That's something that we didn't focus on. One of the things that kept on popping its head up is collaboration, and we're lacking that. We're lacking that between the cities. We're lacking that between the state officials. We're lacking that between the federal officials. I have endorsements up and down the state, as well as Speaker of the Assembly, to congressmen uh, in our area, in our districts. I have real relationships with them. I have them on my cell phone. It's not in theory or just an endorsement. I have endorsements from ALADS as well, as well as the Association of Deputy District Attorneys. I've been doing this my entire life. For over 20 years, I've been in public service, and it's not just something I decided to do because I was bored on a couch. I dedicated my life to public service because it's the most important thing to do. I want the families here in RPV to improve their quality of life. I want to put them first in what they have to say. I promise to listen. And the biggest thing that I want to portray to everybody and to tell everyone is that everyone matters. We listen and listening is the key to fixing solutions. We lack the urgency in this city to solve problems. We lack it. And the biggest problem is that we don't want to apply our political will to solve these issues. We've had these issues consistently over the past uh, 20, 30, 40 years. It's the same issues. I wanna bring a fresh perspective, fresh leadership and fresh ideas to the city council. And in coming months, November 8th, I hope that I can get your support and uh, I hope to earn it and be a good city council member for our RPV families. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I just wanna say a couple quick things. Uh, number one, I said at the beginning that last time the candidates were uh, professional and courteous, and uh, if possible, even more so tonight. 
Uh, last time there were a couple of tiny hiccups with the Zoom feed. This, this time it went without a hitch. So all credit to you guys. And um, I really don't have anything I'd rather be doing tonight. This is, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's as important to me as it is to everybody else. Um, and, and as to the audience, um, I always remember my good friend Dave Zanheiser, who is a reporter for the Times now and used to be for the Breeze. And years ago, he told me that in any community, 2% of the people do the lifting. That's you guys who are out here tonight. So maybe you should give yourselves a hand for being the, the point of the spear of the community. Thank you very much. Thank you. And before we go, how about a round of applause for Noel Park? Didn't he do an awesome job? It's not easy. And once again, for all the candidates. You left me something. You need that. Okay, got it. Don't turn the mic off on me ever. <laughs> so, no, thank you to all the candidates. You were great. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, and again, this is this is going to be shown on RPV TV. The link to it will be sent to the candidates. It'll also be on the homepage of the Chamber's website. Just go down to news. Give us two or three days to get it up and, and posted. And you can also um, catch it on the YouTube channel for RPV TV. Thank you all for being here. Meet the candidates outside. Have some cookies and get home safely. Thank you.